Hi everyone, Assalamualaikum, Salam Sejahtera. In this lecture video, we'll continue with the expansion with topic. We are now in our third session of part 1, where we will look at two sample problems to solve. We will also look at examples of real cases where we can apply this knowledge. In our first problem, we have a simple symmetrical wedge, a free stream Mach number of 3, with a pressure of 20 kPa. I won't go through detailed explanations on how to calculate the exact answers here. In this short video, it will be sufficient to draw the flow diagram and lay out a reasonable plan to solve the problem. To guide you along this process, I will also write down some intermediate answers to the problem. Before we plan out the strategy to solve the problem, please take note that the labeling of region 1 here is a matter of convenience only. If we want to be more accurate technically, we should label the upstream flow using the infinity symbol. In this problem, the free stream flow faces a surface that is deflecting inward with an angle of 7.5 degrees. Because of this deflection, it will produce an oblique shock, where M1 decelerates into M2. Now, this is a doable problem since we've learned about oblique shocks before. If you do this part properly, you'll get M2 equals to 2.63 and P2 equals to 34.69 kPa. You will also need to calculate P02 here because it will be used later to calculate the flows in region 3. At the top corner of the wedge, the flow will be deflected again, but this time through an outward deflection with an angle of 15 degrees. Since M2 is still supersonic, the deflection will produce an expansion fan. Going across this fan, you can use the isentropic flow equations or table. From there, you will get M3 to be equal to 3.41. Here, the stagnation pressure P03 remains the same as P02 because the process across the fan is isentropic. Finally, from this, you can get P3 which should be equal to 10.81 kPa. In the second problem, we have a flow of M1 equals to 2.5 that is deflected inward with a delta of 10 degrees through an oblique shock. The pressure compresses into a higher pressure P2 and going across the shock, M1 will decelerate into M2 which is equal to 2.09. Then the oblique shock hits a boundary that causes the flow to deflect again. But this time, the deflection causes the pressure to reduce back to P1, as stated by the question. For the flow to decompress back to P1, it has to go through an expansion fan. This means that the deflection is an outward deflection, but with an unknown angle, delta 2. Now, here comes the tricky part. Normally, delta 2 is an intermediate parameter that we use to find theta 3 which we then use to find M3 and P3. But instead, in this problem, P3 is already given in the problem statement and set to be equal to P1. So, we need to iterate or guess the correct value of delta 2 until P3 is equal to P1. The calculation process across the expansion fan is rather straightforward, with the stagnation pressure remains the same across the fan i.e. P03 equals to P02. After going through a couple of iterations, you should get delta 2 to be 10.04 degrees and M3 to be equal to 2.48. Just like oblique shocks, expansion fans can also reflect on walls and interact with each other too. And the process of calculating these flow changes is similar to that of the oblique shock. But, unlike the oblique shocks, the expansion process is isentropic, so the calculation process is actually easier than that for the oblique shock. This schematic diagram, as shown in the box here, illustrates the reflection and interaction processes for expansion waves. Here, we have a supersonic flow inside a tube that goes through an outward deflection delta at the upper wall. The flow that passes through this first expansion fan deflects to be parallel to the upper wall that is inclined away from the center line. 
but the flow closer to the lower wall needs to be deflected again to ensure that it is parallel to the lower wall. That boundary condition produces a second expansion fan. To calculate the flow changes across both expansion fans, we need to find the Prandtl-Meyer angles for the flows in all the regions R1, R2, and R3. Theta1 is simply the Prandtl-Meyer angle of the initial upstream flow. Theta2 is Theta1 plus delta, the deflection angle across the first expansion fan. Theta3 is Theta2 plus the deflection angle across the second expansion fan, which is also equal to delta. This problem is now doable to find the Mach numbers and the other flow parameters across both fans. Even though the calculations for these processes are quite simple, the actual physical processes are not. As you can see in this diagram, the expansion fan covers a wider area as it extends away from the deflection corner. As this expansion fan hits the lower wall, it will reflect away from it and continue on to produce the second expansion fan. Because the fan consists of individual weak waves that span out at slightly different angles, different weak waves will reflect from slightly different locations on the lower wall. This produces quite a big region of complex flow interaction. Within this region, there are reflections and interactions among the individual weak waves. The processes are rather complex, and to solve it, we need more advanced computational techniques using CFD, which is beyond the scope of our class. We have now covered pretty much all the key procedures to compute flows with expansion waves. With all this, we can see some examples of real cases where this knowledge can be applied. In Figure 1, we can see interactions of expansion waves inside a tube with a diverging channel. In real cases, we can see such flows inside rocket or engine nozzles. In Figure 2, we can see an interaction between an oblique shock and an expansion wave, as shown here. There are many real examples of such interaction either inside nozzles or outside the bodies of supersonic aircrafts. In Figure 3, a supersonic flow is deflected by an oblique shock which compresses the flow, but because this pressure is not in equilibrium with the ambient pressure, it has to be reduced back to the ambient pressure. This can only be done through an expansion fan, as can be seen here at the upper and lower parts of the object. Finally, in our last slide, we can see the effect of a boundary layer on an expansion fan near a surface wall. If there's no boundary layer effect, we can see a very well-defined, pointed and V-shaped expansion fan at a deflection corner with a sharp edge. But, if the viscous force in the flow is not negligible, it will create a boundary layer over some thickness above the wall. Within this boundary layer, the flow velocity drops below the supersonic speed of the free stream flow. Because the flow inside the boundary layer is now subsonic, no expansion fan can occur inside it. The layer also smoothens the sharp edge of the corner into a more rounded edge. This causes the expansion fan to occur more gradually over a longer distance. We can see that effect clearly in these two diagrams. Also, in the boundary layer, the flow interactions are more complex and the fundamental assumptions to derive the parental mayor flow breaks down, so we can only predict or simulate accurately what happens in the region using CFD techniques. Alright, we've now completed this session. In our next topic, we will look at how to use what we've learned on oblique shocks and expansion waves to calculate the lift and drag on supersonic vehicles. Thank you for listening to this lecture till the end. I hope you can follow through everything in this lecture. See you in our next video. Until then, have a good day and bye.